right? Welcome to Camp Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Shirtliff. This show is heard on WBCQ The Planet every Monday and Friday evenings at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can also pick it up on our Podomatic. That's our flagship uh, podcast, as well as Amazon and Spotify and a whole bunch of others. And uh, I think we'll be uploading this to YouTube as well, since we have video and audio. And uh, today, oh, by the way, this show is brought to you by Camp Constitution, which, among other things, runs a week-long family camp and a weekend retreat, which is coming up at the end of this month, September of 2023. And to get more information, just visit our website, campconstitution.net. And um, we're very pleased to have a, a, and I say a special guest, all my guests are special, and I haven't had a, a live guest in a little while, but uh, his name is Charles Van uh, Vaik, pronouncing it right, Van Vaik? Yeah, that's yeah, pretty good, yeah, the, that's pretty good, the v, the, Yeah, the V is, uh, the W is like German, you know, you don't pronounce, the W's are pronounced as V's. I actually, right. I met you a few years ago, back in 18, at the... Um, uh, the um, Mid-Atlantic uh, Mid Reformation Society's annual uh, event. And I it think is. I did learn to pronounce it properly, but it's been a few years <laughs> since I've seen you. And I actually went to your YouTube channel to make sure I got the pronunciation proper. <laughs> that, was, that was a great a great attempt. Thank you, Hal. A few minutes before the, the show here. Well, uh, Camp Constitution is going to be sponsoring a speaking uh, tour of um, Charles. Uh, now, next week, next Saturday, a week from, well, a week from uh, tomorrow, uh, that would start on September, actually September, Friday, September 15th to the 17th. Uh, we both will be at the Mid-Atlantic uh, Re Reformation Society's annual gathering, the uh, uh, Christendom, and uh, the, the theme is the Gospel at War. And uh, Charles will be presenting on that Saturday, the 16th. And then we'll be getting up really early to drive up to Massachusetts, where I have an engagement because September 17th is Constitution Day in this country. And then on the 18th, uh, he'll be at two venues in Lexington, Massachusetts. On the 19th, he'll be at at least one venue in uh, maybe a private luncheon, but also uh, at a church here in my hometown of Alton, New Hampshire, uh, and then uh, up to Maine for some engagement. So, And then he'll be in Virginia and then eventually California. So instead of mentioning all the dates and confusing people, I'll just refer you to our camp blog in our uh, our calendar so you have the dates there well um i have a couple of i have your book uh, you shipped me some your new book called reloaded shooting back again and that came out in what 2019 yes that's right Hal. uh-huh and this one was your first book about your experiences so instead of reading a biographical sketch on the back i'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself and then uh, talk about uh, that harrowing experience back in, what, 1993. That's right. Well, I am a Christian missionary uh, based in Cape Town, South Africa. And I work from there into Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, been into Cameroon and uh, various, various areas. But we're running two main projects uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, and also in Zimbabwe. So those are the the main areas of work and the whole idea is to uh, work towards forming Christian covenant communities um, among the local population in the different areas. So we don't uh, go and um, have meetings during church times. We try to unite the churches and various congregations in the areas that we work in. So we're there to support the church, to help them and to uh, make a difference in their lives and support them in whatever way we possibly can. So that's the the ministry side of things. And then I, uh, to get to your question on the harrowing experience in one of our church services, we were sitting in a church service in Cape Town, South Africa, in an area called Kenilworth. It was the 25th of July, 1993, when all of a sudden there was a noise at the front door of the church and terrorists stepped in with automatic rifles. Uh, they also had grenades with them, and they had attached nails to the outside of the grenades. They opened up fire on the congregation, and then they lobbed the grenades into the congregation as well. The, you can just imagine the chaos. Um, there were about uh, over a 1,000 people present in the church. The church is built 
very much like a cinema. So it was high at the back and, and lower in the front with a stage uh, in the front of the, the church building. And they'd come in at a front door uh, on the side of the stage. Well, everybody went down, tried to hide under the pews. And when I first saw this happening, I thought that it was a play, a show that was being done. I had a, a young lady working for me that was a youth leader at the church, and she explained to me about a show they were going to do for the youth, where the police were going to come in. You are going to have uh, some young people dressed in police uniforms. They were going to capture the youth leaders, and they were going to have a discussion at the church about what happens if we can't openly and freely uh, preach the gospel of the kingdom in South Africa anymore. So that was the topic. And when I saw this attack happening, I thought, oh, well, now the show is being done for the whole congregation. It's not just for the youth anymore. And it's only when I saw splinters shooting out of the benches that I realized that this is not a show. This is a, a real attack. Um, I went down onto my knees and I had a 38 special revolver with me, a five-shot um, little snub-nosed revolver, two-inch barrel, and I uh, returned fire at the attackers. I was, I was kneeling, as I mentioned, the church, the benches in front of us were going lower and lower down into the front of the church, and so with everybody down, I could take uh, two shots at the attackers, and I then realized that I was too far from them. I was fourth row from the back of the church, which could seat about one and a half thousand people. So it's pretty large. And I thought I better try and get in behind the attackers at close range and shoot them in the back to stop the carnage. And so I leopard crawled. I don't know what you call that in America, but you're down on all fours to keep low from the shooting that was going on. And I ran out the back door of the church. Uh, to come in behind the attackers. And as I rounded the corner of the church to come in behind them, I saw them already standing at the getaway car. Uh, at that stage, I didn't realize that I'd hit one of them with one of my two shots inside the church. And as I came around the corner outside, they were already uh, standing, well, they were already seated in the car, but one of them was standing at the back left door of the car. And he was looking at the door they had come out of the church. And all I can think of is that uh, he was hoping that I'd come running out there and he would have just lowered his rifle and, and blown me away. But by God's grace, I could shoot at them again. I shot another three shots at them from, uh, from behind and they jumped in the car and sped off. Uh, they murdered 11 people that evening and over 50 were injured. Mm. And just quite amazing some of the things that happened that evening, we had uh, some young people, um, Richard O'Keel, he was 17 years old, how he had two little girls sitting next to him. And as the shooting started, they went down onto the ground. The one girl was frozen solid. She just sat there and stared at what was going on. And little Richard O'Keel, 17 year old, he got up on his haunches to pull his girlfriend down onto the ground. And as he did that, he took a bullet to the back of the head mm. and saved saved her life. Uh, another young man, Carl. Uh, how many were Hocker. in the church? How many were about in the church? Over a thousand time? people. Over a thousand wow. people. Hell, wow. yeah. There was one young man. Hell, his name was Gerald Harker. He's twenty one years old. He actually fell on top of a grenade and mm. took a full body blow to himself, killing him immediately to mm. protect the people sitting around him. It's just absolutely heroic. And there was the church had a ministry to Russian sailors who were rounding the the Cape, and they would pick them up and bring them to the to the evening services, and then they would uh, sing with us uh, for the worship, and then later be taken to a, another hall for an interpreted service for them. But uh, one young man, Dmitry Makagon, he was twenty three at the time. He had a hand grenade, he's one of the Russian sailors, he had a hand grenade land in his lap and blew off two, um, both his legs and one arm. Oh my. Uh, he, later, he later got married in the church. Um, the church uh, raised funds to bring his fiance to South Africa and they actually got married in the church. And he walked up the aisle with his uh, prostheses, wow. um, which was actually quite an amazing uh, event at the time. 
So that's a bit of a synopsis, uh, Hal, of what was going on that particular evening. And then my book, Shooting Back, The Right and Duty of Self-Defense, which you've kindly shown us, uh, is based on that attack and what was going through my mind um, before and after the attack. It's interesting. I have a friend, Coach Dave Dobbermeyer, and he has a T-shirt that he promotes, and it says, uh, the devil is coming to your church. And then in the front, it says, protect the flock with a Glock. And that's true is that uh, churches, you would think would be one of the, should be the safest places in the world. They were considered right. sanctuaries, that sacrosanct, no matter what your views are, that was off limits. That wasn't a combat zone. Unfortunately, our communist enemies and our enemies in general don't fight by those rules anymore. And uh, in your book, you mentioned that it's not just to South Africa, but it's really much all over the world. The Christian persecution is just, uh, it's, you know, the brakes have been pulled off. No, not so much in this country to the extent you'd see, for example, in pa Pakistan here in the United States. Well, let me ask you, what is the, uh, were you the only person carrying in the church at that time? Do you, are you aware mm -hmm. that you're aware I know, of? I know of about three other people that were uh, armed at the time. I found out only many years later. Yeah. Um, and uh, but they weren't in a position to do anything about it from where they were. They said there were just too many people in their way. They they couldn't. They would have been yeah. with somebody. Yeah, yeah. That's fact, a, had... the, yeah. There's a friend yeah. of mine, Keith Hansen. He actually trains police and also church church people to how to deal with active shooters. But just having a bunch of guys or gals with guns in the church isn't always just the only thing you need to do. You have to have some kind of strategy. Uh, right. And I think the best thing is prevention. I mean, if I was, uh, you know, a communist thug, I'm probably a coward and I don't want anyone shooting back at me. And if I knew that that church had a very good plan to deter people like me and kill, I'd probably find another church. Well, uh, you've hit the nail on the head there, Hal. I was at our parliamentary buildings in Cape Town, South Africa, and I went in for an interview with a press and I met with the... Uh, the commander of the attackers, the Azanian People's mm. Liberation Army, he's the one who commanded the attack to go ahead. Uh, his name is Letlapa Mpachlele. And Letlapa introduced me to another friend. And he said, uh, I'd like you to meet Charles. Charles is a survivor of the St. James attack, um, 25th of July, 93. And he carried on and he said, there we thought the church was a gun-free zone, mm. but boy, did Charles have a surprise for us. That's exactly what you're saying. Um, they didn't attack the church uh, willy-nilly. They thought through this. They were convinced that there'd be nobody armed inside the church, and that's why they went ahead with it, um, to their surprise. Now, in your book, uh, I guess we both books, I haven't read the, the most recent one, but uh, you visited these these men in prison. Now, let me, let me back up a little bit, too, because now in 1993, Nelson Mandela, his African National Congress was in full control of the country. Um, they're not very sympathetic to Christians, as far as I, uh, I understand. And uh, and these were the now, obviously, this wasn't authorized by the ANC. So they were where they a split this terrorist group. Can you what's right. the name of the group again? That, that's correct. Um uh, we, we make things really complicated in South Africa. We've got uh, loads and loads of political parties and various factions. So this group was called the Pan-Africanist Congress, and they were, as you've just mentioned, a breakaway from the ANC, Nelson Mandela's group. Uh, but the actual attackers were the armed wing of the PAC. So mm -hmm. it gets complicated, but you're 100% correct. It wasn't the Nelson Mandela's group um, that did it. It was a splinter group from his group. That's correct. And uh, was this the first act of violence they did in church in a church in South Africa, or have they have had, had a long history of doing these kinds of things? No, I actually have to agree with what you said earlier. Uh, in South Africa, through the history of South Africa, churches were, were always the go-to place, even during our, our many wars historically. You know, in the last in the eighteen hundreds up till now, is uh, the churches were always the places that the mm -hmm. women and children would go to for safety and protection while the men went to war. It was almost unthinkable to have anybody attack people in a church. And um, that's exactly what you said a few minutes ago. So this was uh, this was pretty chaotic. I'm not sure historically if there ever were any attacks before this, but this one certainly um, caught the attention of the whole world uh, when this happened. It was a very, very strategic um, 
attack from their side. And it's even in our in our uh, school finishing matric history books in South Africa, uh, they they talk about this event. It really made a massive impact. And uh, interestingly enough, I was in an interview again with the commander of the attackers. As you've mentioned, I've reached out uh, to them with the the gospel, and uh, we were talking one day about whether this was a terrorist attack or not. And the attacker said to the reporter, the the commander, he said. This was a terrorist attack in the true sense of what terrorism was all about or is all about. He said this was to instill fear in the whites in South Africa. So we were going through a time of transition in our country. Uh, we had almost got to so 93 was just before the transition, which happened in 94, moving into 95. And they did this to um, scare the living daylights out of uh, the opposition and make sure that they would just cave in. You know, when you're having terrorism in a society, everybody just puts pressure on their leaders and says, look, just give them what they want. Just do mm -hmm. what they say. We don't want any more trouble and we want to live in peace. But, you know, there's there's never any peace when you're living no. at the end of a, a rifle pointing in your direction. That it only leads to more violence by the other side. You just, you, That's you, right. The minute you give in, you can't give in to terrorist communist thugs. And impossible. What are the... um? What are the gun control? Uh, it's really not gun control. It's really human control uh, when it comes to be, and people use the word gun violence. Well, I have a nice collection of weapons. We have a range on our property and you'd be welcome to do some shooting when you, you and your son come Thank here. You. Thank you very much. Um, Looking forward to it. But none of my guns. Uh, it's interesting at night, you know, we go to bed and the guns don't get up in the middle of the night, go out and commit crime. Human beings have to do that. So That's really, right. so when you talk about gun control, it's just really human restrictions. So what are the, what are the laws when it comes to owning weapons in South Africa today? Yeah, the laws changed uh, a while back. Um, I think the laws changed in 2010 somewhere. I, I stand under correction, but they have a new Firearms Control Act, which is extremely onerous. Uh, the mm -hmm. new government made everybody reapply for their licenses so we already had licenses under the the old national party government but they made us reapply and they have an extremely onerous law uh, the law is so bad that basically if you are charged of breaking this firearms control act with the use of a firearm or anything like that or you're found with a firearm in your car that's not registered you have to go to court and prove your innocence you're not presumed guilty which is a travesty of justice. Uh, you know, where on earth, I think the fr French are the only people that have such uh, such crazy laws. Presumption of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, presumption of innocence is like, you know, one of the most basic laws in Christendom, you know. Um, and so they really started with their shenanigans uh, regarding that, and then they made it extremely onerous. It takes hours and hours and hours of paperwork to complete, to get a license. And then your renewals, you do every five or 10 years, depending what kind of license you have. And I can go on and on. It's just absolutely crazy. They're trying to make it virtually impossible for anybody to, to get a firearm. Uh, I certainly can't live here without one. So I, I go to all the trouble to, to get mm -hmm. a firearm license and for my, my wife to, and uh, at the end of the day, this just takes up all your time. You running from pillar to post is an absolute nightmare to get through the system. Um, but you know we have to do these things. Uh, just on the other, on another note, uh, during the the social unrest or the civil war that was going on in our country with the changeover from the National Party to Nelson Mandela's group, there was oh, in about a, a twenty year period. Um, most all parties agree that there were about 20,000 murders in the country mm -hmm. and a portion of that would have been our um would have been uh, specifically political murders just last year in south africa we had 28,000 murders in one year wow it's and just that's with all the crazy. that's with all the strict gun control well it's interesting uh, in, in this country if you looked at you know the all 50 states and if you just looked at certain areas of usually cities, the big cities run by Democrats, the inner cities, most of the violent crime and murders are happening. So if you took out, I'm guessing maybe 400 square miles of the country, put that aside, we would probably be the safest country in the world. Wow, that is crazy. Yeah, yeah it's unbelievable. Now, the, the gun control laws really do nothing except, as, as you mentioned, they're all about control 
well. They, they're certainly not about protecting the innocent. And, and we have a police, for the, a police force that is completely compromised. And so these people cause absolute havoc in our country. Just yesterday, they arrested two policemen that are involved in, in heisting of trucks, you know. Um, yes. And so these people, and they sometimes even do it in their uniforms and things. It's just, you <laughs> can't even trust these <laughs> these guys. It's unbelievable. You know, that's not we're not that bad in this country yet, God, uh, thank God. But I've heard, I knew a gentleman who was a doctor on an Indian reservation in uh, one of the Dakotas. I'm not sure which. And he said, on the Indian reservations, you never call the police. You're better off dealing with the criminal directly. But let me give a contrast. Here in the United States, of course, we have 50 states and the district of, we call it the D.C., but district district of corruption, right? <laughs> uh, I used to live in Boston, which is in Massachusetts. And mm -hmm. um, back when I first got out of the Army, I went to the local police station. I got what they call an FID card. And I went to the local uh, the Woolworths. There was a chain store in the United States. They don't think, think they're all gone now. Downtown Boston and bought myself a Ruger 22 with a 10 round uh, capacity and got on the subway. I, got, I bought maybe a couple hundred rounds of uh, 22, got on the subway and went home back to my, my home in, in the Hyde Park section of Boston. You can't do that today. Very, very difficult. You can get a firearm. So uh, they actually passed a law in the mid 90s that made it more difficult. And all of the people that had FID cards, it was an ex post facto law, which is supposed to be unconstitutional. So I never bothered to get another one. I just kept the 22. I didn't shoot a whole lot. And in May of uh, 2020, there were riots around the country in the wake of the George Floyd death. And uh, the the uh, I almost said ANC, Antifa. I think the ANC is a little bit tougher than our Antifa. Uh, but, you know, when you uh, they like to go after 90 year old men wearing MAGA hats, you know, Trump supporters mainly. Or when they outnumber you 20 to one, they can be pretty nasty. So they threatened to burn down our local police station in Boston. And I lived in one of the better neighborhoods of Boston. And here were the people boarding up the businesses, boarding up their stores. That's a vote of no confidence. The city councilor uh, was in was in favor of the terrorist. So uh, I said, well, I, I better we better upgrade my, uh, you know, my rifle. My son didn't even have one at the time. So we called a hold of the police department. He says, well, you have to apply to get a permit. In other words, you have to be in a waiting list. I said, OK, wow. well, put my name on the waiting list. And thankfully, uh, in fact, they were targeted. I, I understand that I was a target because of my uh, not just outspokenness on issues, but also the pending lawsuit, which we won't go into today. Uh, yeah. And so uh, my son, we sent our my wife and my daughters to a to a uh, in-laws house 20, 10, 10 miles away. And we just put the lights out and we were waiting in case nothing. Thankfully, thank God, nothing happened. But we end up moving it to New Hampshire uh, in December of 2020. And within a few weeks, we got our driver's licenses. And in New Hampshire, all you need is a driver's license. And uh, you, as long as you don't have a felony conviction or a misdemeanor a domestic conviction, you can pretty much get anything you want. So after the, getting my license, we went to the local gun shop and we got uh, ARs and 22s and uh, 38s and what have you. Uh, and then I get an email in March from the city of Boston, come in and apply. All we need is $100.00. You have to take a, a, a course, a, a marksmanship <laughs> course. And of course, I, I qualified as an expert marksman in the United States Army. That doesn't count. And fingerprints. I said, no, I'm good. And New Hampshire has a very low crime rate, even though uh, you can actually cons uh, open carry. Uh, they call it constitutional carry. I can wow. walk down the street with my AK. My, with my, AK oh, we actually, my son has an AK, but I have uh, an AR. <clears throat> or I can just carry it. And uh, our crime rate's pretty low because and well, when incredible. you have a when you, when you have a meet <clears throat> when you have a public meeting, uh, you might have a few counter protesters, but they're not count causing violence because they know that most of the people at that meeting are carrying. And the old saying is that an armed society is a polite society. That's right. That's right. I, well, I want to point have... out. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just about to just agree with you. You know, in, in Africa, we have thugs in government and we have thugs on the street. You know. Um, so we certainly need arms. And if you look at countries that have uh, gun control, as you mentioned earlier, the people live as absolute slaves. Uh, you think of Zimbabwe. Right. They, they can't even take a stand against their, their government. And they just keep on rolling on cheating, lying, yeah. uh, you know, causing havoc, reappointing themselves after the next elections uh, again and again. And it, that's the way it carries on. And uh, I minister in the Democratic Republic of the Congo another gun-free zone, and their pastors have been buried alive by rebel mm. soldiers. 
because wow. they were accused of their prayers changing the war in a negative manner towards the rebels. And I spoke to one of the leaders in the church and I said, why didn't your um, your church leaders, uh, your deacons, just come out with their firearms and their rifles and say to the rebels, go ahead, make our day. Make our and they day, said, oh, yeah. no, no. They said, we don't have anything. Our firearms have all been taken away from us. And as you mentioned earlier, too, you know, a gun-free zone doesn't mean there's no guns. It just means that the government and the rebels have the guns. Uh, but right. no, no God-honoring man can protect his family at home or in church on a Sunday. And so they've had rebel soldiers killing people in churches and that in Eastern Congo, too, you know. But uh, that, that's, wanna, that's the way it is. Yeah. You said God-honoring. I, I think we have a biblical mandate. You know, Jesus said, sell your cloak and buy a sword. And at the time, that cloak wasn't just something you wore, you know, once in a while. That was your major, major, major garment that kept you warm That's at night. Right. That was an expense. They didn't have stores where you could just go and get in. Um, also, the in the Apostle Paul said to uh, that if you do not provide for your own, you're worse than an infidel. I think it's one of the, I forget that it was Corinth, no, um, Corinthians or uh, anyway. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was First Timothy five verse eight. Timothy, that's, um, that's thank right. Thank you for the correction. Yeah, yeah. Timothy. And to it's me, it's not no. providing isn't just taking your children to Disney World. Providing mm -hmm. is their safety, and so I believe we have a biblical mandate. Now we only have a few minutes left, and I think one of the one of the things that impressed me about you, and I think of uh, Pastor Rumbron, tortured for Christ, where he one of the prison guards who was one of the most cruelest ended up falling in disfavor, and he was end up as a prisoner. And he ended up protecting this former, uh, his former torturer. And to me, that really takes a lot of, it's really difficult to truly love your enemies. But you did that same thing. Uh, tell us a little bit about that in the few minutes that we have remaining. Well, yes, it was a very difficult thing for me to do. I didn't just all of a sudden forgive everybody and carry on mm -hmm. with life as usual. I really struggled with forgiveness. And that's another story on its own. You know, we can chat about that when I see you soon. But uh, it took me a while to get through this idea. In fact, I even made up a theology of unforgiveness, which I was very proud of at the time. <laughs> uh, but uh, when I did forgive these people, and, and, and forgiveness at the end of the day means that you're not going to take revenge against them, and you're leaving it in God's hands. And yes, there is a supposed to be a justice system that works. I did take part in that. I was called to, um, to go to court in the high court in Cape Town uh, to stand witness there. But uh, be that as it may, uh, when I forgave the attackers, uh, that opened up the door for me to reach out to them and go visit uh, the chap I'd shot inside the church. He had been caught. Uh, his blood got onto the seats of the getaway car, and police had arrested him through forensics. They managed to, to uh, arrest him. And I took the gospel of the kingdom of God to him, and I visited him in prison multiple times, got to meet his commander that I, I mentioned earlier, and even now, this is 30 years later, we're still dealing with these men. We are reaching out with them. A friend and I who's actually a former policeman who was an arch enemy of them. And we take the gospel to them. We go sit, we have a meal together, and we talk about helping each That's other and, and making a difference in each other's lives. So pray, praise God for his forgiveness for us. And if he's forgiven us, who are we not to forgive others? That's right. We only have about a 30 seconds left. Where could the listeners and viewers learn more about your incredible ministry? Uh, shootingbackbook.com. Shootingbackbook.com will take them through to my website. There, there they'll we see Here's my the... book, Shooting Back, and reload it as well. That's right. So okay. please let them visit there, and that'll be great. I really appreciate your, your uh, um, visit on the radio. Thank you. All right. Well, we're looking forward to uh, seeing you again and spending some time with you and your son. So God bless you. And you, uh, folks, thank you for listening or watching. You've been watching or listening to Camp Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Shirtliff. And until next week, may God richly bless you. All right. Thank you, Hal. That was great. Really appreciate Excellent. you having me on your show. And I really look forward to seeing you and your family. Amen. All right.